tonight. Severe weather from coast to coast during one of the busiest travel days of the year. Massive waves and high surf pounding the California coast. Water and debris pushing past beaches and washing out roads. Flood advisories in effect and evacuation warnings are in place for some areas. Meanwhile, rain and fog continue from the Midwest to the Northeast as millions of people hit the roads ahead of the new year. Also breaking tonight, an American woman believed to be held hostage by Hamas confirmed dead. Israeli officials say she was killed on October 7th with her body then brought to Gaza. Israel also admitting it made a mistake when it killed civilians during a strike on a refugee camp in Gaza. But tonight fears this war could expand well beyond the Strip. A senior Israeli official threatening increased action against Hezbollah in Lebanon. Damage control Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley under fire for failing to say slavery was the root cause of the Civil War after a town hall question. The backlash she's now facing and how she's defending that answer. Master of disguise, a fugitive on the run arrested after a four-year manhunt. Wanted for stealing over $100,000 and under investigation for murder, evading police by changing his appearance, flying under the radar with over a dozen aliases. What we know about his real identity. Plus, Canyon Rescue, two people surviving after their car flipped over an embankment, then sliding 100 feet into a canyon. A nearby hiker seeing the crash, calling for help. How rescue crews were able to get the passengers to safety. And second chance, Virginia finding new ways to humanely clear animal shelters and give inmates a chance to change lives. A look inside the program pairing the incarcerated with foster pets. Top story starts right now. Good evening, I'm Zinclair Samoa in for Tom Yamas. We begin tonight with evacuations in California as a high surf and a storm surge is flooding parts of the coast. Just look at Santa Cruz, California. Water is completely washing over beaches and coastal roads, flooding entire neighborhoods. Highway Patrol there advising people to stay clear of the area, which is completely submerged or covered in debris. One person walking along the beach nearly hit by a wave crashing into the pier and seawall. Powerful surf there, the front doors of residents flooding patios along the beach. This all happening as massive storms barrel through the country, bringing runways to a standstill. Another day this week of stalled travel plans for thousands of flights. So we begin tonight with NBC's Aaron McLaughlin in New York. More than 100 million Americans travel ahead of the new year. Wet weather washing out parts of the West Coast with potentially deadly riptides and flooding in California. To the north, coastal communities ordered to evacuate due to life-threatening waves. Everyone okay? While in the south, some residents getting out any way they can. It pushed in probably like a storm, like a surge. You know, the water couldn't get out. Meanwhile, on the east coast, a slippery slog. There was a lot of flooding, so I'm glad we left early and got out on time. With heavy rains causing flooding in Philly and beyond. While in the plains, they're digging out after a dangerous ice storm, knocking out power for thousands. There's a lot of power lines that are down. It's going to take a long time to put those back up. This on one of the most congested days to be out on the road. Bumper to bumper traffic the whole way there and the whole way back. Instead of flying where they charge you for every baggages and stuff like that, just throw everything on the top of the car. Still, millions choosing to brave America's airports. We are at the height of holiday travel season. With many airlines experiencing delays, today Southwest had more than 900 according to FlightAware. In Florida, a log jam due to overwhelming demand. Some travelers even spending the night. I am tired. It's cold. Oh, man. Uncomfortable. But for much of the country, the rare holiday gift of relatively smooth air travel. It was pretty easy to get down here. And, yeah. You know, I'd say pleasantly surprised. Aaron McLaughlin joins us now from LaGuardia Airport in New York. Aaron, what's the latest on those flight cancellations and delays? Well, Zinclay, today nationwide, there were only 72 cancellations, but 4,500 delays. That, according to FlightAware, that is pretty good compared to previous years. Here at LaGuardia, there were only a few cancellations, but you, as you can see behind me, the situation's pretty calm. Zinclay. Aaron. Aaron McLaughlin, thanks so much. And that wet winter weather is not over just yet. A new storm system tonight approaching the West Coast with heavy rainfall and wind gusts. So let's get right to it with NBC News meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Michelle, what's the latest on the track now? 
Hi there, Zinclay. Well, we're still so unsettled in the east. We're going to take a couple days to clear out. It's not really going to be until Saturday until we clear out. The west coast remains unsettled, too. And we have those waves that will dissipate by tomorrow morning. That's ahead of the next front that's coming in. We're also looking at some showers in the south. We're looking at some snow showers in portions of the Midwest. Also, some rain showers, some freezing rain in spots there. So we have a few spots that are very unsettled, uh, making for very tricky travel. That's going to be the case as we go throughout Friday as well. And in terms so travel impacts, we're looking at likely delays in Boston, New York City, also Chicago, D.C., Atlanta, Miami. You should be good. On the West Coast, we're looking at Seattle, possible delays, and San Francisco with that rain moving on shore. We're looking at likely delays. So the Great Lakes in the east, light rain and some wet snow as that storm system kind of moves off to the east and then completely moves out by Saturday. The West Coast, we're looking at that heavy rain with another front moving on shore. It's another atmospheric river. That's why we're seeing those waves so large now. It's ahead of this front moving on shore. We're also looking at really windy conditions. Those winds are going to continue tomorrow. Then as we near Saturday, we'll keep the San Francisco airports probably likely with delays as the lingering showers continue. Also some snow showers. But look at the East Coast finally looking much, much better. Boston, New York City, uh, D.C., Chicago, New Orleans, Miami looking good on Saturday. And Sinclair, we're going to continue to watch slow improvement. Not tomorrow. We're going to see showers in the Northeast. But finally by Saturday looking good and looking good by Sunday night for the ball drop in New York City. Back to you. Just in time. Thank you, Michelle Grossman. Now to the other major major headline tonight, Israel admitting it was at fault for a bombing in Gaza that killed civilians and for the killing of three hostages by its soldiers. We're also learning a U.S. citizen who was believed to be in Hamas captivity was actually killed by the group on October 7th. NBC's Josh Letterman has the latest. Tonight, in a rare move, Israel's military admitting serious mistakes. Acknowledging a Christmas Eve strike on a central Gaza refugee camp unnecessarily killed civilians. Israel saying its fighter jets were targeting Hamas sites, but also struck nearby buildings, adding the IDF regrets the harm to uninvolved individuals. The IDF also concluding an investigation into how Israeli troops mistakenly killed three hostages this month, saying their deaths could have been prevented. A spokesman saying, we are responsible for what happened. Meanwhile, another American family is grieving tonight. 70-year-old Judy Weinstein, a U.S. citizen, was believed to be held hostage in Gaza. But her kibbutz announced she was actually killed in the October 7th terror attacks and her body brought to Gaza. Her 73-year-old husband suffered the same fate. There are now six Americans presumed captive in Gaza, including IDF soldier Adon Alexander from New Jersey, who turns 20 tomorrow. He's my boy. And every day, every minute of the day, I'm, I'm just... I'm terrified. And a former hostage is speaking out tonight. 20-year-old Mia Shechem was held for 54 days. Now free, Shechem compared her experience to the Holocaust, saying she was held not in a tunnel, but in a family house with women and children. She recalls the hospital where she says a surgeon operated on her hand without anesthesia, telling her, you're not coming home alive. And for the hostages that remain in Gaza, few signs of hope for new negotiations. Josh joins me now from Tel Aviv. Josh, we know the IDF has taken responsibility for what they're calling serious mistakes. Have they come forward with a plan to make sure these kinds of incidents don't happen again? Well, they're not giving specifics, Zinclay, but the military says that its fact-finding and assessment mechanism, which is part of the general staff, uh, is investigating the incident with an eye toward learning lessons from what happened to make sure it never repeats itself. Zinclay. Josh Letterman in Tel Aviv, thanks so much. For more on the latest in the Israel-Hamas war and what could be next for diplomatic relations in the Middle East, I'm joined by Hagar Shamali. She served as the spokesperson to the U.S. mission to the United Nations under the Obama administration and is currently the former spokesperson for terrorism and financial intelligence at the U.S. Treasury Department. Hagar, thanks so much for joining me. So first, I want to ask about news today that a senior Israeli official said the time for a diplomatic solution with Hezbollah in Lebanon is, quote, running out. Out. So do you anticipate that the fighting in Lebanon will actually escalate? And what does this warning mean for the rest of the region? Well, in general, you're seeing Israel 
battles several fronts, and it's not just Hezbollah, right? You have the Houthis, you have attacks from Syria, you have threats coming from Iraq, Iran, and so on. And all of that, all, what all of that means is basically they're trying to poke a bear without creating an all-out war. And, and that is by Iran, because if they pursue an all-out war, if Iran pursues a massive attack against Iran, if Hezbollah pursues a massive attack, sorry, against Israel, if Hezbollah pursues a massive attack against Israel, then the United States is going to intervene, and they know that. And so they're trying to do everything short of that without causing the U.S. to get angry and, and pursue attacks on, on behalf of Israel. And so I don't expect war in Lebanon to explode the way it did back in 2006, for example. And the reason for that is that Hezbollah is trying to show its mafia boss, Iran, that they're doing something. They're trying to show their people that they're doing something, mm. but they don't want to create an all-out war because they have too much to lose, unfortunately. They have public support in Lebanon. They control now the airport, the government, the financial sector. And so when they have that at stake, they don't want to pursue an all-out war. But that yeah. said, Israel is growing tired of these strikes. No, the stakes truly are high, Hagar. And we also got the news in Josh's piece that an American citizen who was thought to be taken hostage by Hamas was actually killed on October 7th. So we've also just learned Secretary Blinken will travel again to the Middle East and Israel. With all of these developments, do you expect the tone of this meeting to be different from those past? Or do you think the U.S. will just double down on Israel's current positioning in the war? Well, the United States tone has increasingly been about transferring to low intensity operations, increasing humanitarian aid, and really limiting or avoiding civilian casualties. And the reason for that is not only because it's the right thing to do, but because it undermines Israel's strategic goal of having a broader secure state in this region if they have this many civilian deaths and if they have this many people displaced and put into poverty where they can't even return to their homes because they've been turned into rubble. And so the, the pressure coming from the United States, I expect it only to get stronger and louder. However, However, I don't expect the U.S. to change its position on calling for a ceasefire, in that they won't, or in placing extra conditions on U.S. aid going to Israel. Well, let's dig into that a bit more, right? Because Israel is now expanding its offensive into Gaza. That's no secret. Millions of people have been displaced, as you said, struggling to eat, drink, many homes turned to rubble. So do you think there will come a point in the war that the U.S. does need to intervene more to provide safety and aid and shelter to the people in Gaza? You, yes, for sure. This is one of the priorities of the United States, is to increase humanitarian aid and increase its speed. And what they might end up having to do is to try and take on responsibility on their, on themselves. For example, maybe they can get another border crossing open if they promise to inspect the aid on their own and get it in there. Um, things of this kind. The UN is unable to have, to, to bring in enough aid and at a speedy, at a, at a speed that can address the massive need that is, that is there in Gaza. And so you're going to see that pressure all around. But the, but the Israel government at the same time, while they are very receptive to the U.S. and, and they, that is a perspective they pay very much attention to, at the end of the day, it doesn't necessarily mean that they also do everything that the United States wants. And so that's going to be a difficult, That's you're going to have friction there for sure. It doesn't yeah. mean that alliance is going to fray, but you're going to have friction there. It's not going to be 100% in lockstep. And Hagar, I mean, the U.S. is facing this pressure. We're seeing pressure from the international community, but also the Israeli government has faced increased scrutiny, right? And in Israel, there are are reports that a leaked document from the high court in Israel says it's actually planning to overturn part of the judicial reform law that was passed under Netanyahu and the government over the summer. So what does that mean for the state of Israel and national unity, especially at a time like this? I found that report fascinating because the judicial overhaul that Prime Minister Netanyahu was seeking was in large part what was resulting in massive Israeli anger at him uh, before October 7th. You saw massive protests all summer and spring because of the judicial overhaul he was pursuing, which, by the way, a lot of it was intended to shield himself from a corruption investigation that he himself is facing. And so to see that, on one hand, it shows that perhaps this, this, this can has been kicked down the road. But at the end of the day, Israelis have really voiced themselves in that they are very angry at Prime Minister Netanyahu. Regard now, this is just on top of it. But at the same time, they view him and his policies as having created the vulnerability that Hamas took advantage of to pursue their horrific October 7 terrorist attack. And so I don't think it's going to save Netanyahu in the end. I think it's a matter of time before he goes. Time won't tell. Hagar Shamali, thanks so much for your insights tonight. Let's turn now to the 2024 election and the Republican presidential candidate on the defensive, Nikki Haley, on damage control after she left out slavery when asked about the root cause of the Civil War. This at a critical moment for the Haley campaign with just weeks until the first Republican primary. Here's NBC's Ryan Nobles.
Tonight, Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley in cleanup mode after leaving out slavery as a root cause of the Civil War during a town hall in New Hampshire on Wednesday. What do you want me to say about slavery? No, um, uh, you've answered my question. Thank you. Next question. Haley spent Thursday attempting to explain what she meant. Of course the Civil War was about slavery. And make clear the role slavery played in American history. We know the Civil War was about slavery. But it was also more than that. It was about the freedoms of every individual. Her opponents seized on the comments. President Joe Biden responding, quote, it was about slavery. And GOP rival Ron DeSantis arguing she isn't ready for the big stage. The minute that she faces any type of scrutiny, uh, she tends to cave. As governor of South Carolina, Haley pushed for the removal of a Confederate flag on display on the Capitol grounds after a mass shooting at a black church in Charleston, carried out by a white supremacist. It's time to move the flag from the Capitol grounds. She made that decision after intense pressure by African-American leaders in the wake of the massacre. The firestorm comes as Haley is gaining ground on the clear frontrunner, former President Donald Trump. Trump has routinely used divisive rhetoric and recently made racist comments about migrants and minority groups. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. But Trump's controversial words have done little to change the trajectory of the race. And these comments come at a make or break moment for the Haley campaign, with polls showing Donald Trump leading by more than double digits, with just 18 days to go before Iowa and less than 30 days before New Hampshire. Zinkley? Ryan Nobles, thanks so much. Next, breaking news tonight out of Maine. The Secretary of State there removing former President Donald Trump from the state's presidential primary ballot. This is the first move by an election official to take action independently in the decision. So let's get right to it with NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Danny, first off, walk us through what we know here. What does this mean? This is breaking right now, but what we know is that Maine Secretary of State has made a decision uh, to keep Donald Trump off the ballot over opposition, of course, from Trump's team, which briefed the issue and argued that under Maine law, the secretary didn't even have the power to exclude Donald Trump from the ballot. So expect legal challenges to the extent the Trump team can uh, challenge this decision. But of course, all it highlights also is the vastly different procedures that each of these states are arriving at in applying their own state's law. These are totally different procedural issues, whether it be in Michigan, Maine, Colorado, wherever. And Danny, notably, Maine is not the only state to attempt this. I'm thinking of Colorado and Michigan's Supreme Court recent ruling. What does this all mean and what happens if it makes its way to the Supreme Court? It's almost certain to make its way to the Supreme Court. In theory, the court could decline to hear the cases. Uh, I guess that's possible, but highly, highly unlikely. Uh, but uh, what would happen at this point is the court doesn't technically have what's called a circuit split, which usually means when the federal U.S. courts of appeals have differed on the law in different circuits. But instead, what you have is different state courts uh, arriving at different conclusions using state law. Normally, that wouldn't be grounds for the Supreme court to take it up. But of course, these state law decisions using their own state's election law have such massive impacts on the federal election of the president and federal law and the Constitution so that the court is almost certain to take up these issues. All right. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalas on that news of the state of Maine barring former President Donald Trump for the ballot. Thank you so much. Now to the caravan of migrants making its way towards the southern U.S. border. The thousands of asylum seekers continuing their days-long march through Mexico. As Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas meet with Mexico's President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador to address the migration crisis. For more on those talks and the influx of migrants in cities nationwide, Morgan Chesky joins me now from Dallas, Texas. Morgan, what's the latest on that meeting and the situation at the southern border? Yeah, Zinclay, 24 hours after this meeting took place, we have had a chance to hear from both sides, and they have acknowledged that it was a productive and, by all accounts, successful meeting between the U.S. delegation and the Mexican president. As for what was specifically discussed, we're gaining uh, bits and pieces. It was a closed-door negotiation, uh, but some of the key topics included how both countries could, number one, bolster law enforcement on both sides of the border, how Mexico could promise to crack down on the smuggling trade that facility 
facilitate so many migrant families to the Rio Grande, where they can then cross. And the U.S. promised to uh, expedite more uh, repatriations back to Mexico. Those were just a couple of the conversations that took place. Mexican President Zinclay acknowledged the importance of not necessarily focusing on a border barrier or more barbed wire as a long-term solution, but reestablishing ties with these Central American countries where so many of these migrants are coming from. We do know that there will be another cabinet-level discussion held in Washington in January of next year. Uh, as for whether the Mexican president will attend that, it remains to be seen. Uh, but this was certainly a step forward after a record-breaking week at the border last week where more than 12,000 migrants crossed illegally in a single day, that in and of itself, an all-time record. Clay. I mean, Morgan, as you speak, these records are being set, but it's not just impacting the border, right? I know the mayors of Chicago, New York, and even Denver have requested more federal help in managing these growing numbers of migrants in their cities. New York City Mayor Eric Adams even issuing a new executive order in just hours ago about exactly when and where buses of migrants can arrive in the city. So I think the question here is, what are cities doing to grapple with this crisis? Well, they're using every bit of available space they can. Mayor Adams from New York calling out Governor Greg Abbott of Texas by name, saying that he is intent on creating chaos. The city, New York, has just opened up a tent encampment on the outskirts that at one point was used as a campground. And we know that in some instances, the mayor has directed shelters to turn migrants away after they've stayed there 30 days and have them reapply because space is in such short supply. And in Chicago, the state is now sponsoring hotel rooms for migrant families. Uh, Governor Greg Abbott, for his part, says that they will continue busing and or flying migrants to these northern, what he labels, sanctuary cities because the surge happening here in Texas is what he calls unsustainable. So whether it be the south or the north, uh, the one thing that they can all agree on is that the numbers of people coming across is, again, unsustainable. As for whether or not, uh, as for when these federal resources uh, could arrive and help expand space. Uh, that remains to be seen, uh, but certainly uh, it, it is approaching a level that is alarming. Sinclair? Morgan Chesky in Dallas, Texas, thanks so much. We're back now with the latest update in those University of Idaho student murders. The house where the deadly attack took place demolished by the school. But some of the victims' families disagree with that decision, saying the home should have been preserved as evidence for the killer's upcoming death penalty case. Dana Griffin now with what comes next. Within hours, the University of Idaho demolished the home where Ethan Chapin, Zana Carnodal, Madison Mogan, and Kaylee Gonzalez were stabbed to death. You know, it's nice to see the house come down. Two victims' families pleaded with the university and prosecutor's office to halt the demolition until after the trial, saying it could still be relevant to the jury. The court has yet to set a date for that trial. The prosecution argues that they've already collected measurements for any possible exhibits, and due to Idaho code, a jury walkthrough wouldn't be authorized. Getting rid of this daily reminder of the horrific event that happened here is, is a relief and, and a step in healing. The university acknowledging security concerns and the $700 daily fee to protect the property factored into their decision. Prosecutors have requested a six-week summer trial date in the death penalty case. Legal experts believe the defense will seek a venue transfer to a larger city with a larger jury pool. How much does that disrupt the timeline of getting to trial? You know, it, that shouldn't change things. In fact, that might speed things up a little bit because they, you, have, you get a larger jury pool. Um, you might be able to find a jury faster. And away from this small town, still healing from the brutal murders. The university says that lot will sit vacant until they come up with something to do with it. Now they're turning their attention to a memorial garden on campus that will honor those four victims. Zinclay. Dana Griffin, thanks so much. Now to the bombshell arrest of a man known as the master of disguise. Fugitive Tyler Adams caught on a California street after spending four years on the run using more than a dozen fake names. The 51-year-old charged with fraud and theft and still under investigation for the death of his girlfriend in 2022. The shocking arrest witnessed by none other than the girlfriend's father. NBC's George Solis has this story. Tonight, the hunt for a felon dubbed the master of disguise is over. Tyler Adams, a fugitive who's evaded authorities for more than four years, 
changing his appearance and adopting more than a dozen aliases, according to the FBI. Hands on your head. Arrested at gunpoint on the streets of Newport Beach, California, on charges of fraud and grand theft. And now, facing extradition to Hawaii, where he escaped from a correctional facility in 2019. He has no friends, he has no family, and he knows how to disguise himself, and he knows how to charm people. I did not think he would be caught. David Sabian is the father of Raquel Sabian, Adams' former girlfriend. According to the FBI, the couple traveled to Mexico last April, in June, an Amber Alert was issued for the couple's then seven-month-old baby, Valentina. The principal suspect is the wrong father of the baby. Authorities ultimately finding the baby safe, but tragically discovered Sabian's body in the trunk of a car in Tijuana. So we put uh, the father of the baby into custody of the immigration authorities. As Mexican officials tried to turn him over to U.S. border agents, the career con man somehow escaping their grasp using a fake ID to cross back into the United States, according to a criminal complaint. This is the master of disguise, right? And he's a con man. He's a slick talker. Adams vanishing without a trace for more than a year until his shocking arrest in November. Get on your knees right there. I'm the closest pedestrian to this action. And they say, get your hands up, get out of the car, or I will shoot you. In a twist of fate, David Sabian witnessed the arrest. And I'm looking, and I'm like, wait a minute. The guy gets out of the car, has a yellow shirt on, white pants, white boots. I said, that looks like the guy that killed my daughter. Though not charged in connection with Raquel's death in the U.S. or Mexico, the FBI confirming Adams has been arrested. But for this grieving father, it's not enough. I've been depressed for a long time over this incident. He should have been charged with murder. They should have been looking for him as a murder suspect, not as an escapee. NBC News San Diego reports that the FBI questioned Adams about the disappearance of Raquel in Mexico, where he remains a suspect in her murder, but say he's been uncooperative. Adams pled guilty to misdemeanor counts of grand theft and fraud and is due in court next week related to his fugitive status in Hawaii. George Solis, NBC News. Coming up, a rescue at the bottom of a canyon in California, a car sliding down an embankment in San Francisco with two people inside. The race to get those people out next. We're back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the urgent recall of magnetic balls meant to relieve stress. The recall involving 4,200 units of relaxed magnetic balls after regulators found their magnets do not comply with federal regulation and could cause blockages and blood poisoning if swallowed. At least seven deaths and more than 2,000 hospitalizations have been linked to similar products. The balls were sold exclusively online at Walmart from February 2022 to April 2023. And two people are lucky to be alive after their car slid down a steep embankment in San Francisco. Video shows fire officials on the scene at Glen Canyon Park descending 100 feet to get to the trapped car. The driver of that vehicle reportedly hit a curb, causing it to roll once before sliding down that hill. Both passengers were taken to the hospital with minor injuries. A health alert tonight, the FDA issuing a new warning about fake Ozempic. The agency sounding the alarm after it sees thousands of counterfeit versions of the diabetes turned popular weight loss drug. So far, no one has been seriously hurt. However, five cases of adverse events have been reported. Regulators advise only purchasing Ozempic through authorized distributors and checking your boxes, lot and serial numbers on the FDA website. And pop diva Cher has filed for a conservatorship of her son, Elijah Blue Allman, saying his life is at risk. The singer claiming Allman is unable to manage his finances due to severe mental health and substance abuse issues, according to documents filed in the L.A. Superior Court. Cher was previously accused of kidnapping her son for an intervention in November 2022. Claims she has since denied. The 47-year-old is Cher's second child with the late rock singer Greg Allman. Let's turn now to an NBC News broadcast exclusive investigation about the retail industry and the true cost of those consumer bargains for the workers who make the products. NBC's Richard Louie has more on this and how shoppers can think twice before picking deals. Deals are at your fingertips. Prices have been falling. Stores are still trying to woo consumers with further discounts. End of year sales, good deals for some, bad deals for others. These jeans, shirts, and jackets, stylish, but some may be products of modern-day slavery, says the United Nations, including some brands we've all come to know. 
people forced to make garments to pay off unjust debts or work in inhumane conditions. Products available in every state in America. Online too. Fast fashion getting too fast. At the holiday season especially, we don't necessarily know where those clothes are coming from. Louis C. DeBaca, former U.S. ambassador for anti-slavery. There's this thing called debt bondage. The United States is not immune. We used to call it sharecropping. While some call it a form of slavery, where a tenant works the land, paying their debts with a share of their crop, never making enough to leave the land. By the end of the week, you owed more to the place that you had to buy your groceries or where you had to pay your rent. Human trafficking survivor Elijah describes the conditions he experienced. There were dozens of boys and men packed like sardines, and to disobey meant severe punishment, days, sometimes weeks of fasting, or worse, beaten till bones were broken. Forced labor stories like Elijah's are alive and well. NGO Transparentum and its two-year study in one country found migrant workers had to pay prohibited recruiting fees to get their job. Payback taking months or years in unsafe work conditions, as defined by the International Labor Organization. NBC News has not independently verified Transparentum's findings in Mauritius, but the State Department just downgraded that island country in their latest human trafficking report. One worker estimated the, that he owed over $11,000. The equivalent of almost five years of wages, says E. Benjamin Skinner. He's been investigating human trafficking for over two decades. It's a devil's choice. It's something that they feel that they have to do in order to improve their lives, in order to improve their families' lives. When shown the investigation's results, some brands did nothing to help the workers. But then there are the other companies. PVH, Barber, Second Clothing, those, those brands that, that stood up and made the hard choices to spend money, to do the right thing, to, to, to reimburse workers at one of these factories. Of 18 companies shown the research, while publicly not admitting all of the findings, 11 did something, says Skinner. For PVH, owner of Tommy Hilfiger, Calvin Klein, and others, they decided to help workers by reimbursing them some $400,000 in total. Those brands that have made it right need to be applauded. They need to be re rewarded. See the person behind it. There is not one piece of clothing that any of us wear that is made wholly by robots. There is a person who had their hand on that. Uh, we're wearing what they made for us. A mix of buyer beware and buyers learning to care. Richard joins me here on set. Richard, I got to say, I'm a longtime fan of your reporting. And this one in particular, I think is going to shock some viewers, especially yeah. in this era of one-click shopping. They don't think about what goes on behind the scenes. So what can consumers practically do? You know, you can spend five minutes here, Zinclay, and actually do a lot of things before you hit buy or you go into that mall. First off, there's some sites that I want to talk about. First off, there is Know the Chain. What they do is they rank and they have a scorecard of different brands and companies based on where they're buying their products and where they're they're selling it and the amount and indicators of forced labor. Another really interesting one, Good On You. And that Good On You site shows the top 10 fashion brands, the top worst, if, I, if you will, fashion brands, based on this very topic of how clean is the labor and where these particular garments are being made. So pick the top five and then go out and buy their products, right? Whether it's online or it's at the mall. This one's interesting. Slavery footprint. Mm. What you can do there is enter everything you've got in your closet, plus what you might be buying in the next three to six months, and it simulates figuratively how many modern slaves you own based on what's in your closet. Wow. That's sobering, right? But very interesting in their approach. Finally, Transparentum, which this NBC News exclusive is based upon, they've got eight other reports that you can check out, and they basically show you what are the companies doing after they're made aware of indicators of forced labor. Do they do something? or do they not? So four sites you can go to, spend five minutes before you hit buy or you hit to the mall. News you can use, Richard Louie. There you go. Thank you. Now to top stories, Global Watch, and we begin with the kidnapping of more than a dozen villagers in central Mexico. Officials say 14 residents, including four children and three policemen, were taken by a drug cartel as apparent retaliation for an uprising led by farmers angered by cartel extortion that killed 10 gang members earlier this month. Now, local officials say they have not received demands for ransom. And Kim Jong-un ordering North Korea's military to speed up preparations for war with the United States. The leader urging sectors such as the nuclear weapons program 
time to ramp up their military capabilities to counter what he called unprecedented aggressive actions by the United States. Earlier this month, the White House warning that any nuclear attack by North Korea is unacceptable and will result in the, quote, end of the Kim regime. And the Thai cave, where a youth soccer team was trapped for weeks, has reopened for tourists. Thirteen boys and their coach were exploring the cage back in 2018 when flash floods trapped them underground. The world riveted for 17 days until dive teams were able to pull off a complicated rescue and get everyone out safe and alive. Now, guided tour groups can enter the infamous third chamber and learn about the operation. Tickets cost about 40 U.S. dollars. Now, when we come back, is fun dead? Yeah, that's the question addressed in a new Washington Post column that argues steep costs are sucking the fun out of just about everything. When we come back, a money expert weighs in on how to bring joy back to everything from weddings to vacations. Don't go anywhere. We're back now with Money Talks and an article that caught our eye today about the financial and emotional cost for items and activities that most consider enjoyable. In the Washington Post style section, writer Karen Heller declares, fun is dead. Yikes, she writes in part, consider what we've done to fun things that were long, big fun, now overwhelm, exhaust, and annoy. And one specific event she calls out, weddings, saying weddings have morphed into multi-stage stress extravaganza while doubling as express paths to insolvency. Strong words there. Another key stressor, time off work. Vacations are overscheduled with too many activities, FOMO on steroids, fear of missing out, that is, a paradox of choice-inducing decision fatigue, so much so that people return home exhausted and in need of another one. So after uh, the holidays and vacation season, I want to bring in money expert and founder of her first 100K, Tori Dunlap. Tori, I'm so glad to be speaking with you. My friend and I were talking about your work just last night. Let's start, though, with the weddings, right? Because it's no secret life is getting expensive, but the article specifically called out the average cost of weddings just this year, if we look at those numbers, and estimated almost 25,000 of having a wedding, and that's not talking about participating in one. That can cost for bridesmaids from $1,200 to $1,800 just for a close friend's wedding. I can personally attest to this as well. So how do we plan for both the expected costs and unexpected costs of a wedding? I'm nodding too because I've been there as well. Thank you for having me back. I think with everything we're talking about in this article between weddings and vacations, we really need to be better about setting expectations and also setting boundaries. Setting expectations for ourselves about how much can we afford, how do we want to show up, but also setting boundaries with our friends. I think especially with weddings, especially as a bridesmaid, there's a commitment of, of course, showing up on the wedding day, but showing up with your dress, with the shoes, with the makeup, at a bridal shower and the bachelorette party. And it just gets to be a lot, especially on your wallet. So I think setting expectations with yourself, coming up with a budget of what you actually can afford, and also having the ability to say no. There's a way to delicately set boundaries with your friends that still show them that you care, but also that you're not going broke to try to show up for their wedding. I love that. And that speaks to almost the increasing trend of, I know, brides telling their bridesmaids, hey, this is how much it's going to cost. Do you want to do it or do you not? Uh, let's talk about, though, another thing a lot of people like to do. That's vacations, right? Ideally, you come back restless or excuse me, rested. <laughs> that tells you how my vacation went. But regardless of your budget, how can you make sure your credit card points and frequent flyer miles go further? A lot of people rely on those with their money. Yeah, I literally just took a vacation two weeks ago, all on credit card points. And so I think that that's one way you can be really smart in terms of planning a vacation that feels luxurious and feels exciting without too much planned is using your credit card points or using your cash back that you've accumulated throughout the year. One of my favorite hacks is to not necessarily use your points within the portal, within the credit card portal, but actually transferring those points to something like an airline or a particular hotel chain. Your points will go farther that way. And I think again, setting expectations with ourselves. What kind of vacation do we actually want? If you want to just sit on a beach all day, you can prioritize that, right? I think that there's a balance between time off and rest. And I think we associate it as the same thing, but often time yeah. off is not useful. So finding the balance between those. I love that. I wonder as a financial coach, do you encourage people to spend money on things or experiences? What does that look like? 
Personal finance is personal. And I truly believe that you have to be mindful of your purchases and of your own values. I talk about this in my book, Financial Feminist, but finding ways that you can be mindful of your spending and make sure that your hard-earned money is going to things that you actually love. Yeah. For me, that is travel and food out and honestly plants. You can see behind me, I have a ton <laughs> of plants in my office. But for other people, that might be a coffee. That might be you know, a handbag or clothes. It also might be a concert totally. or you know, out with friends. So it really, truly is personal, but you have to figure that out for yourself. And I want to talk end game here because retirement is another big stressor for a lot of people, specifically, I think of millennials and Gen Z, because it's said that our parents needed to save about $1 million to retire. But a recent Charles Schwab study found that most workers today believe that that magic number will grow to 1.8 million. That's quite the difference. So how do you recommend we save while still enjoying the fun things in life? I mean, I've said it multiple times in this interview already, but there is a balance that you can strike. And that's the biggest thing I work with people in our community on at Her First 100K is finding that balance between spending according to our values and spending money on things that bring us joy while also prioritizing our own retirement. And the truth is, like, diets don't work just like spending, right? If you tell me I can't spend money on this thing, all I'm going to want is to spend money on that thing. So we're not eliminating our purchases in order to hit that financial goal. We're finding that balance. In terms of re retirement savings in particular, a 401k, take advantage of it if you're offered through your employer, especially if you're offered a match. A match is free money. They're doubling your percentage contributed without you having to do anything. You can also set up automatic transfers to make sure that your retirement is on autopilot. And if you already are saving for retirement, investing for retirement, that's fantastic. I would encourage you to increase it a percentage and see how you feel. Bump up your retirement contributions by a percent as we go into this new year or 2%, you probably won't feel it. And it allows you to invest even more to protect your retirement. Tori Dunlap, really helpful insights, especially as so many are feeling paralyzed by their money at the end of the year. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. When we come back, a story of unlikely pen pals, shelter dogs in need of a permanent home, getting one-on-one -on -one attention from a special group of trainers in a place you would not expect. That story next. Finally tonight, a remarkable story of Second Chances, a program in Virginia teaching inmates to rehabilitate and train shelter dogs, all with the hopes of helping them find a new permanent home. Here's NBC's Maura Barrett. That's Miss Gigi. For Gigi, Dallas, Zara, and Phoenix, the first stop on the road to a second chance is in an unexpected place. Turn down. Yes, good girl. Yeah. Good. The Beaumont Correctional Facility, a temporary home for these dogs and others, and a way to get them out of Virginia's crowded shelter system, where the animals often face the risk of being put down. Good boy, stay. The unique program called Pixie's Pen Pals is a partnership with the prison and Fetch a Cure, one that was severely missed during the pandemic. It allows inmates, some who are serving decades long sentences, to work with a professional trainer and behavior specialist to get a dog ready for their forever home. Oh, it's a win, 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 because, you know, we're opening up a spot in a shelter. Obviously, these guys are learning so much. Team building, conflict resolution, you know, it's so bad. It's a lot of um, give and take, a lot of compromising, and it helps you with, uh, you know, dealing with people, uh, not just the partner, but, you know, the other guys that's here, you know, and we are advocate for the dog. Teaches us, like I said, how to be patient and kind of productive and just finally being able to do something good. There's not too many jobs while you're locked up that you feel good about doing. Dogs like Gigi will train with their handlers for six to eight weeks until they pass their canine good citizen evaluation and can be adopted into a new home. It's a paid job for the handlers, like Christopher Dudley and Benny McCroskey with Dallas, a pit bull mix, and Chance Winnington and Delvon Finney with Zara. They're paired up in teams, and the dogs stay in their cells with them. You, know, you, you have to come to terms together on, you know, and it teaches you a lot of skills in that way, too, of being able to communicate. Yeah. That's why schedules are really important. You know, you're feeding off of each other. You're, you're learning from each other. You know, you got to know sometimes, like, I don't know it all, and I've got to sit back and know when to listen. It really reads all your, all your energy, your body language, so it's important, you know. 
and being on the same page with training. The result, smiles on both ends of the leash. Like I said, it's not just therapeutic for us, it's for in the morning, all the guys are lined up for work. And they love him. He comes out and greets each one, so they're all, it brightens their day for the day. It really does give you a purpose. Like when you have something to get up in the morning for and you know like, okay, this is what I'm doing today. This is what, you know, it changes the dynamic of being incarcerated. The vast majority of any population we're here for violent crime, being entrusted with the life and the welfare of another creature, it kind of changes your perspective. You know, it may even give you a different worldview. In Richmond, I've always had rescue dogs because I feel like there's wonderful dogs out there that just haven't found the right home. Penny is a proud graduate adopted by Susan Bennett almost seven years ago, one of about 80 rescues placed each year. When they said, well, Penny's ready to go home. So I went up to the prison, two inmates there that had trained her. One of them gave a presentation about telling me that she liked to cuddle and she was house trained and she loves cheese and she likes to chase birds and all that kind of stuff. Really a lot of good information about her and her personality and how she loved to snuggle and things. After she had finished the presentation, the other inmate had Penny on a leash and so actually showed me how she knows to sit and stay and shake and, and down and those types of things. And then they gave me a nice little um, portfolio that they had put together that had all their notes as long as, as well as all of her medical records and everything. And sit. How long has sit. Sit. I love the dual purpose of it helps a dog that needs a home and at the same time, it helps the inmates to help them really learn those life skills. Meaningful connections on all sides <laughs> and living proof that you can teach an old dog new tricks. More Barrett, NBC News. Thanks so much for watching Top Story. For Tom Yamas, I'm Zinclair Samoa in New York. Stay right there. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.